Welcome to today's video. Today, we follow the story of Toya Delgado, a 30-year-old woman seated in a storage room. Beside an open window, her gaze fixated on the towering trees resembling candles in the adjacent square behind the Registro Civil Building, where she worked as a janitor. Before her lay a cup of cold coffee, a bowl of crumbled cookies, and a brief moment of respite. She observed the tall tree's white trunk swaying, with the golden hues of autumn leaves, finding solace in nature's warmth during this week-long spell of late summer days. Memories. Uninvited. Tiptoed into Toya's thoughts. It had been seven years since the tragic demise of her husband, Pablo. His untimely death left her a widow, caring for their three-year-old twins, Manuel and Celso. Toya navigated these years bidding farewell to the life she and Pablo had meticulously planned. In the aftermath of the dreadful tragedy, she reluctantly quit her job, unable to balance caring for her young children and meeting the demanding expectations of her employer. Her boss, typical in his professional detachment, prioritized high-quality work and frowned upon absences or requests for early leave, securing a nanny for two toddlers simultaneously proved an insurmountable challenge, compounded by financial constraints. With no parental support, Toya faced these hardships alone. She had never known her father, lacking any information about him since her early childhood. Her mother's passing at the age of 12 was bewildering. She succumbed to untreated double pneumonia, leaving Toya grappling with the mysteries surrounding her family's history. As a young girl, Toya struggled to comprehend the circumstances surrounding her mother's departure, unaware of the underlying details that later unfolded. Social services intervened, directing Toya to an orphanage until her grandmother, Taya, took over guardianship. This particular orphanage nestled outside the city amidst woodlands near a narrow river provided Toya with a surprisingly comfortable life. Contrary to the grim stories often associated with such institutions, this one treated children with humanity, regardless of how they arrived there, be it through abandonment as infants, tragic loss of parents, or families hitting rock bottom. In this environment, Toya struck up a friendship with Julia Cano, who had lost her parents in a helicopter crash during an excursion over African jungles. Despite their contrasting personalities, Julia being lively, cheerful, and resilient while Toya remained calm, reserved, and composed, especially in the company of strangers, the two girls formed a deep bond. Julia often reminisced about her family's opulence their grand house, and global travels. Yet after her parents' tragic demise, none of their affluent relatives took responsibility for her. Thus, she found her home at the orphanage, forming an unbreakable connection with Toya, who exuded a quiet inner strength. Through life's trials, their friendship endured. Julia played a pivotal role in anchoring Toya after the loss of her grandmother and later her husband, preventing her from succumbing to irreversible despair. Taya, Toya's grandmother, lovingly raised her, and Toya reciprocated by causing her no significant trouble. Their lives fell into a harmonious rhythm. Toya's schooling, household chores, involvement in the young constructor club, and college years all passed seamlessly. Bread-breaking gatherings with her future son-in-law became customary, where Taya showcased her signature yeast pies. Their modest yet dignified wedding marked. The moment Taya entrusted her cherished granddaughter to Pablo, relying on his noble and honest character for Toya's future, 
Taya lived in a cozy two-room apartment within an old building. Despite its size, the high ceilings gave it an airy feel that Toya grew to cherish deeply. Confident in finding solace within the dependable walls of her grandmother's home, Toya soon confronted life's transient nature. Despite the happiness she found, its permanence faded, giving way to new trials. Following Toya's wedding, her beloved grandmother passed away unexpectedly, though Dorida had been vigilant about her health. Managing her hypertension diligently, her sudden and peaceful departure due to a heart attack caught Toya off guard. The loss was difficult for Toya to accept. Yet Julio, unwavering in his support, and the presence of her beloved Pablo and their endearing twin boys helped ease the grief. With time, the pain subsided, making room for the joyful responsibilities of a growing family. Transitioning from a factory dormitory, the young parents and their children moved into Dorita's apartment. Stepping into a brighter chapter of their lives, Toya marveled at her fortune, contemplating the possibility of a divine hand at work. Finally bestowing upon her days of joy after enduring a lifetime of tribulations, Toya and Pablo's paths converged unexpectedly at work. Striking up a conversation during lunch, Astonishingly, Pablo, like Toya, had grown up in an orphanage. His experience even more arduous, abandoned by his parents shortly after birth. Throughout his childhood, he yearned to locate his biological parents. Embarking on relentless searches that yielded minimal information, their meeting sparked a profound connection. That evolved into deep affection both having faced parental absence. They were determined to foster a genuine family, built on love and mutual respect. Their shared history and a deep love for each other solidified their bond, making it inconceivable to imagine life without one another. Despite their parental deprivation, they committed themselves to creating a genuine family, where love and respect were the foundation. Pablo and Toya both held esteemed positions as engineers. Within the confines of the machine manufacturing plant, Pablo's career trajectory showcased significant advancement, earning him the reputation of a promising designer. Among his colleagues, varied perceptions abounded. A couple openly harbored envy towards his accomplishments, while a few others covertly held similar sentiments. In an environment where female engineers were a rarity, some female colleagues engaged in subtle flirtation, adding an undercurrent of interest to the workplace dynamics. Managers had set high aspirations for Pablo's future, contributing to the mix of office intrigues and friendly relationships. Overall, Toya and Pablo were deemed successful individuals, complemented by their status as a content and joyous couple. Two years into their marriage, Pablo ventured into securing a loan for his own car. Marking the next phase, enhancing their living standards. As they contemplated enrolling their children in daycare, the family yearned eagerly for a new addition. Yet, life often veers off its intended course. Unpredictability reigns supreme, reminding individuals that assumptions are mere fabrications subject to the capricious whims of fate. All these perceptions shattered abruptly one fateful day when, in the midst of attending her mobile phone, Toya encountered an unfamiliar baritone voice on the line. Toya Delgado. The stranger's stern formality pierced through the receiver, jolting Toya with tense surprise. Yes. It's me. She responded anxiously. Sergio Sanz from the police. Hello. Who is Pablo Delgado to you? The words struck her heart like a spear from the left. An intense agony seizing her. He's my husband. What happened? What's wrong with Pablo? Her voice quivered with dread. Could you come to the following address? Sergio requested. 
and before she could fully comprehend. Toya's world blurred. Her head swirled into an abyss of unknowns. In the distance, the cries of her twins pierced the air. One sobbing in anticipation of looming sorrow. The other joining in an unstoppable chorus of grief. Yes. I'll be there soon. Toya whispered, collapsing on the sofa. Overwhelmed by helplessness. Amidst her turmoil. A persistent thought lingered. I need to get up. I need to go. Outside. The square bustled with brides and grooms. Guests holding flowers. And festive speeches filled the air. Toya. Regaining her senses. Watched the brides in their long. Flowing white dresses with a mix of admiration and a hint of wistful envy. Her gaze held the wisdom of someone. Who had traversed life's fragile pathways for far too long. Grasping its every nuance. Summoning her strength. Toya donned her rubber gloves. Grasped a bucket. And embarked on her next assignment. Alongside her part-time online work. She diligently fulfilled her duties as a janitor at the Registro Civil. Seizing every opportunity to earn a living. Incidentally. It was Julia's connections that facilitated Toya's employment at Registro Civil. Owing to the manager's acquaintance with Julia's parents. When the manager learned of Toya's poignant story as a destitute orphan. Compassion prompted her to extend a helping hand. This fortuitous turn of events transpired when Julia. At the age of 19. Had already made strides in her own life. Graced with a one-bedroom government-provided apartment. Julia found unwavering support from the manager who not only renovated her living space but also guided her after college. Skillfully orchestrating her job placement, while maintaining a respectful distance from Julia's personal affairs. The manager discreetly steered her in the right direction, offering subtle guidance and mentorship. Engrossed in her janitorial duties at the offices of Registro Civil, Toya found herself swept away by memories once again. Uninvited but unresisted. Memories. This time. Invaded her soul without solicitation. Yet she found no inclination to fend them off. The pain she had endured resurfaced. Having laid her beloved husband to rest. Unable to bid a proper farewell after the tragic accident. The closed coffin denied her the chance to kiss his cold forehead. Leaving a void of closure. Instead. The authorities presented remnants of Pablo's belongings for identification. A mangled watch with a piece of the bracelet. A miraculously preserved portion of a patterned boot. Likely severed in the explosive blast. At the sight of Pablo's fragmented boot, overwhelming emotions triggered a visceral reaction. Nausea gripped her. Darkness clouded her vision. And she succumbed to unconsciousness. Awakening in the corridor on a wooden bench. She was greeted by a familiar. Gentle face. Grandma Taya's soft smile. Tenderly urging her to rise. However. The image dispersed as if dissolving into the ethereal space. Revealing Julia. A devoted friend. By her side. It was Julia who guided her through the sorrowful journey to and from the cemetery attempting to pull her away from the haunting finality of the grave. Standing beside the mound of earth adorned with mourning wreaths and flowers, Toya's mind reeled. Immobilized by grief, Julia implored her, pleading to leave, reminding her of the waiting children at home. Yet, Toya's legs turned to jelly, her senses numbed by the overwhelming weight of loss. She remained rooted to that solitary spot. Consumed by an endless void. Overcome by despair after the funeral. Toya found herself engulfed in a ceaseless whirlwind of emotions. Grappling with an unrelenting hardship. The ever-pressing burden of financial strain. Financial strain forced them to part with their car and. 
a few meager possessions to merely make ends meet. Until Toya could secure suitable employment. Fortunately, they managed to secure two coveted spots for their children in a daycare facility, offering a semblance of physical relief, while Manuela adapted fairly well. Celso's adjustment was marked by incessant crying for nearly two months until the reassuring presence of either mom or Aunt Julia coming to fetch him settled his distress. Celso, however, remained somewhat resistant to daycare until he transitioned from the preschool group. Each morning, he voiced his discontent, protesting loudly as Toya completed her cleaning duties in Katerina's office. Katerina Morales, the head of Registro Civil, bore a reputation for her stern and demanding demeanor, creating an environment of categorical expectations for her staff. Toya, engrossed in her tasks, unexpectedly collided with Julia while exiting the office, prompting Julia's excited interruption. Julia, what's with the rush? Are you out of your mind? Dashing around the registro civil, Toya queried, caught off guard by her friend's haste. Ignoring the sarcasm, Julia firmly grasped Toya's hand and whispered, Katrina's in her office. Get in there. I've got thrilling news. Entering Katerina's office and settling onto the plush couch, Julia leaned in conspiratorially. So, my dear, the news is, Kaya is resigning. Kaya Bravo, a former lawyer and esteemed expert at Registro Civil was the sole authority entrusted with conducting significant registrations, such as marriages and births. Toya, surprised, raised an eyebrow inquisitively. Why is she leaving? Julia, playing the role of the well-informed confidant, responded. She's heading to the big city to be with her son. Apparently, something concerning his daughter prompted her move. Toya, apparently missing the underlying implication, prodded further. Can't you see the real reason? Julia shook her head in mock exasperation. No. Toya, you're missing the point. There's an opportunity opening up. And you'd be perfect for it. I'll talk to Katerina if you're hesitant. You're creative. Talented. Well-educated and articulate. Remember those fantastic morning performances at the orphanage? With a bit of practice, you'll be an exceptional host. The best one could find. Besides, you're a stunning beauty. Unlike the underachiever Kaya, the idea of a new life stirred within Toya, triggering a shiver of uncertainty. A new life? I've had enough of that. I don't need more. Julia. Undeterred. Persisted. Come on. Toya. A host. That's your path. Are you planning to scrub floors forever? Look at what you've become over the years. We'll get you in shape. And you'll embark on a fresh chapter. Toya hesitated at the thought of a drastic change. Hosting. Me. Julia retrieved her compact mirror from her purse. Pausing for a moment before continuing their conversation, Toya tossed the compact mirror back into her purse without opening it. Why not? Life's already becoming easier. Maybe I'll return to the factory or explore opportunities at a construction company. I toyed with the idea of management. Perhaps even securing a position at a car dealership. They're always seeking managers. Julia, however, dissuaded her, cautioning. Managing a dealership isn't a walk in the park. It's sales driven, like a squirrel in a wheel. Not everyone thrives in that atmosphere. Toya, you might find yourself struggling again. It feels like you've made it your mission to live my life for me. 
Toya remarked. But Julia chose to ignore her words. Continuing the discussion. All right. Then. Katerina is expecting you to take up the position tomorrow. Remaining silent. Toya smiled wistfully. Though a tinge of anxiety or melancholy seemed to flicker in her eyes. An unfamiliar kind of sadness. Distinct from mourning her deceased husband or grappling with life's established norms. She felt a sense of stagnation. As if she had reached an impasse. Lately, amidst the backdrop of nature's serene beauty, peculiar premonitions haunted her. An unsettling feeling of impending change. A foreboding sense of fate lurking around the corner. She hadn't shared these ominous sensations with Julia yet. However, her pragmatic friend remained observant during their interactions. Sensing Toya's mood shift, Julia seized a momentary pause to inquire calmly. Toya, is everything all right? Is something happening? Toya regarded Julia, a friend almost like a sister, with a friendly gaze. I've been wanting to talk to you about something. I was contemplating it even before you showed up unexpectedly. Julia's brows furrowed with concern, waiting anxiously for Toya's response. What's going on? Tell me. Toya hesitated for a moment before confiding. For the past few weeks, I felt a premonition. A strange sensation of something impending. It's an eerie feeling. Like sensing an imminent danger or change on the horizon. It's hard to define. But it's unsettling. Concern etched across Julia's face. She asked. Is it related to Pablo? Quickly dismissing any misconceptions. Toya warned. No. It's not that. It's different. It's something. Intangible. Something unknown. It's been seven years. Julia interjected. Attempting to reassure Toya. You can't torment yourself with this. Toya. Undeterred. Recounted a recent dream she had. Last Friday. I dreamt vividly. Pablo sat behind the wheel of our car in an empty city. It was deserted. With no one around but us. I was walking toward him. Wearing a light dress. The sky was a bright blue. The sun shining. And the air filled with pleasant scents. Pablo appeared in my dream. Beckoning me through the windshield with a wave. I approached the car. Slid open the door. And settled into the seat beside him. Leaning in for our customary kiss. But in an instant. A wave of fear surged through me. Causing me to pull back. The person in front of me. Resembling Pablo. Was a stark stranger. A mere semblance of him. As if he wore a mask. I felt an uncanny mix of fear and an inexplicable fondness towards this imposter. It was perplexing. Leaving me bewildered. A sensation akin to having crossed eyes and a silly smile. Coupled with a peculiar certainty that change was imminent. Julia. With an attentive gaze and an air of curiosity. Listen to Toya's narrative without interruption. Oh. Toya. It was just a dream. Julia chimed in. Attempting to soothe her friend's unease. But. If you wish. I know a psychic who. Toya chuckled at Julia's suggestion. You haven't changed a bit. Julia. Their conversation was abruptly interrupted by. The entrance of Katerina herself into the office. Toya promptly stood up. Acknowledging Katerina's presence. Yes. I'm here. She responded. Noticing the evaluating glance Katerina cast towards Julia. May I have a word with you? Toya. Katerina inquired. With an inscrutable expression directed at Julia. Her stern gaze urged Julia to vacate the office. Julia. 
Please leave. Katerina insisted. Her tone firm yet tinged with a hint of motherly concern. Reluctantly. Julia complied. Leaving the room with an air of discontent. Katerina gestured for Toya to take a seat closer to her. Signaling the commencement of a serious conversation. Toya. I've observed your work for five years now. You're a perfect fit for the position of civil registration specialist. Katerina declared. Her voice exuding confidence. Your educational qualifications are inconsequential. If necessary. I'll arrange further education for you. Can you handle the documentation required for civil status registrations? Marriage certificates. Divorces. Births. Deaths. Toya. Taken aback by the sudden proposal. Managed to interject. But what about my education? Nonsense. Katerina dismissed. I have faith in your capabilities. I will entrust you with these responsibilities. If there's a need for further education. It will be arranged. You've proven your competence during these five years. With a flick of her hand. Katerina signaled her confidence in Toya. Offering her a new role that encompassed. The management of critical civil documentation. Toya stood in the office. Bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. The proposition for a new role had taken her by surprise. The mantle of handling solemn registrations seemed both. Daunting and thrilling at the same time. Katerina's confidence in her abilities was palpable. And Toya's heart raced with the promise of change on the horizon. Offering you this role is the best decision. Katerina declared. Her confidence unwavering. Toya. Hesitant. Voiced her concerns. What if I can't do it? Katerina's response was firm and pragmatic. You won't know unless you try. Just get the job done. And that's all that matters. Toya's grin widened. She felt the winds of change brushing against her soul. A harbinger of something new and promising. Why are you smiling so openly? Katerina inquired. Her head shaking in mild disbelief. Toya's response was filled with newfound enthusiasm. I'm just excited for the opportunity. Tomorrow. You'll have everything sorted out. Katerina announced. No more cleaning for you, come dressed appropriately to take over Kaya Bravo's duties. I've already found a replacement cleaner. A ray of hope pierced through Toya's life once more. Illuminating her path after the loss of her husband. She had learned not to hope. To shield herself from disappointment. Yet. This unexpected offer had stirred a glimmer of anticipation within her. Toya hurried home to her twins. Feeling an unusual sense of liberation. As if she were a bird soaring freely through the skies. She envisioned sharing the news with her boys. Narrating her new role as if she were a lead actress on a grand theater stage. Peeking into her son's bedroom. She observed Manuel and Celso. Both now ten years old. In the depths of their dreams. The sight of them evoked a surge of emotions within her. A mix of wonder and concern for their future. As she tucked them in. A myriad of questions raced through her mind. What paths would they traverse? What men would they grow up to be? Contemplating the weight of motherhood and its intricate beauty. Toya lingered for a moment longer before retreating. To her makeshift bedroom in the living room. Her heart was alight with a newfound sense of purpose. An anticipation for the path that lay ahead. Toya approached the portrait of Pablo hanging above the dresser. Illuminated by the gentle glow of a nightlight. Casting soft shadows across the room. The hushed tranquility was punctuated only by the rhythmic. Ticks of her grandmother's old wall clock. Filling the air with a subtle cadence. Staring at Pablo's photograph tenderly. A lone tear trickled down Toya's cheek. Betraying the emotions that surged within her. 
with a delicate touch. She wiped it away, murmuring softly to the portrait. Pablo. Where are you? What message do you have for me? Please. Visit me in my dreams once more. Perhaps then. I'll understand. Brushing away the tears that continued to stream down her face. Toya gazed at her husband's portrait again. Imprinting his features in her mind. Hoping to recognize him if he were to appear in her dreams once more. Unaware of when she drifted back into slumber. Toya found herself engulfed in a peculiar dream before dawn broke. She was transported to a bustling maternity hospital. Where the symphony of laboring women and newborn's cries echoed through the corridors. Clad in the same ethereal dress from her previous dream, Toya navigated through the unfamiliar setting. A silent observer in this strange scene. As she traversed the hospital's corridors, a striking figure caught her attention. The head of the department. An affluent woman exuding confidence and opulence. Adorned in an extravagant mink coat. An ornate hat. And wielding a leather bag. She radiated wealth and authority. Mesmerized, Toya watched the woman's graceful stride. Accompanied by the resonant echo of her heels. And the lingering scent of expensive perfume. Suddenly, the woman halted, turning her gaze toward Toya, causing her to jolt awake. Disoriented, she found herself seated on the worn-out sofa, grappling with the disconcerting shift from the dream realm to reality. The clock indicated it was only six o'clock in the morning. Bewildered by the dream's enigmatic elements, Toya grappled with its significance struggling to decipher the unfamiliar woman's identity. Haunted by a sense of fear, she tried desperately to recall the woman's face, but was met with an unsettling void. The woman's visage eluded Toya's memory, slipping away like a fleeting mist. Perturbed yet intrigued, she resolved to keep her unsettling dreams to herself, opting to observe these puzzling episodes that had begun to pervade her nights. Toya sensed a growing pattern in these vivid dreams. A premonition of more mysteries waiting to unfold. Within those enigmatic nocturnal tales. The pivotal lesson. According to Julia. Was not to succumb to fear. Life had been Toya's stringent teacher. Instructing her in the rigors of various professions driven by necessity. From the intricacies of motherhood to the path of self-betterment. Even the seemingly mundane task of cleaning rooms held deeper complexities. It demanded more than mere scrubbing, a blend of knowledge, skills, and the secret to leaving a room immaculate. Untouched by water stains or cloth residue, Toya comprehended this subtle artistry. Transitioning into her new role, she encountered challenges, yet adeptly navigated them sculpting a well-manicured landscape in her profession. Document handling posed no formidable barriers. Owing to her background as a former design engineer, traits such as precision, clarity, and a penchant for simplicity were the pillars of her professional persona. Crafted meticulously over time, her upbringing, nurtured by the orphanage caregivers and her grandmother Dorita, and polished by her engineering career, sculpted her into a diligent, responsible individual, adorned with self-discipline, engaging in solemn ceremonies as part of her role required, not only administrative prowess but also a flair for performance, a role Toya meticulously prepared herself for, embracing criticism as an avenue for growth. She exhibited genuine interest in her newfound vocation, adapting to it with grace. Ordered to wear two distinctive outfits for her roles. Toya's friend Julia, always concerned about her appearance, orchestrated salon visits, securing her a dedicated stylist and manicurist. Her tenure at the Registro Civil etched a profound mark on Toya's character, granting her a sense of stability amid life's undulating rhythms. 
however. Amidst this stable stride, loneliness nestled deep within her, manifesting as desolate nights where tears soaked her pillow. Toya's love for her departed husband, Pablo, remained unwavering, an emotion that she could not imagine betraying for anyone else. Her devotion to Pablo eclipsed any possibility of embracing another, particularly to preserve her son's sanctity. Manuel and Celso would never comprehend or forgive her for such an act. Days flowed into months, and Toya observed a curious shift. Her once vivid and unsettling dreams had receded, granting her a respite from their enigmatic embrace. This pause from her nightly reveries seemed like a temporary reprieve. A welcome respite from the mysterious visions that had previously plagued her. She harbored no uncertainty that these dreams held a message meant specifically for her. Acting as either a premonition or a cautionary sign, they manifested in the form of intricate allegories, aiming to communicate something significant, whether pertaining to the past, present, or future. However, on a particular day, these peculiar dreams resurfaced. Another ordinary workday had concluded favorably for Toya. She felt content with the ceremonies she had overseen in the Grand Hall. They had been lively and animated. Yet, the exertion left her utterly fatigued. Thirty couples had joyfully tied the knot, adorned in their wedding finery, exuding love with their tender gazes, lush bouquets, and celebratory champagne. A wedding day signifies the official and solemn initiation of relationships and the establishment of a family. Each ceremony was brimming with genuine happiness. Taking a brief respite in her office, Toya pondered. Beyond the festivities lies the reality. She reflected. Everything truly begins after the wedding. Life unfurls intricate paths filled with tangled quests and challenges. Wisdom. Knowledge. Resourcefulness. Determination. All crucial to navigate these wild rivers. And if there's love between the two, it becomes the guiding beacon. Understanding. Readiness to sacrifice. These are what truly matter for a couple. Alongside good health. During this moment of repose. Reclining in her chair. Toya seemed to prepare a speech. A toast she'd deliver in honor of the newlyweds. As was her custom. Later. As usual. She regaled her children with a bedtime story. My darlings. I often wonder until what age I'll continue spinning tales for you. She mused. Tousling their hair affectionately. We'll never tire of your stories. Mom. Both replied in unison. You'll keep telling us stories until we're very old. By then. I'll be up in the sky with Dad. She chuckled. All right. My dears. My throat is parched today. I talk all day at work and then here at home. How about you create a story for me tomorrow? Deal. Deal. Manuel responded joyfully. Great. Good night. My twins. She kissed them good night and closed the door. Neither Manuel nor CSO demanded much emotional effort from her. In that regard, they mirrored Toya herself during her school days. Studious. Never bringing home trouble. Both attending a sports school. However, Manuel exuded quick assertiveness and was prone to adventurous antics. While CSO took a more deliberate, ponderous approach. Often delving into philosophical musings and weighing the pros and cons. Though the twins bore a striking resemblance in their early years. As they matured, differences emerged. Manuel started resembling Pablo, while CSO increasingly resembled Toya. Sometimes, it tempted her to observe these variations in her children, noting the subtle shifts in their appearances over time. 
Toya lay in bed. But sleep eluded her. Opposite the couch, a framed portrait of Pablo drew her attention. Ensnaring her in the depth of Pablo's gaze. Unaware of when she drifted off. She found herself slipping into a distant void akin to Alice in Wonderland. Transported to a house that resembled a sprawling castle. The house stood grand and spacious. Stretching across two stories. The ground floor boasted an expansive living room. A dining area. A kitchen with a well-stocked pantry. And a bathroom featuring a shower. Upstairs housed private bedrooms equipped with amenities. A hallway. A library. An office. And a billiard room. Outside. Meticulously crafted flower beds graced the facade. While a meticulously tended garden sprawled behind the house. A path led to the garden. Flanked by marble statues of Greek gods. Beyond the verdant trees and foliage lay a glistening. Greenish lake. A spectacle signifying this was no ordinary dwelling. As if carried there by an unknown force. Toya materialized in the living room, seemingly out of nowhere. The room exuded the opulence of an English castle's hall. Adorned with intricate woodwork. In the distance. A roaring fireplace cast a warm glow. Flanked by two inviting armchairs. A colossal chandelier crafted from copper and crystal hung from the ceiling. Illuminating the walls adorned with exquisite artworks. Amidst the dimly lit ambience. The sound of footsteps heralded the arrival of a lady. She was the same woman from Toya's previous dream. Clad in a silk floral robe. Her voice. Velvety and refined. Resonated through the room as if she were an opera. Singer with a mezzo-soprano pitch. Her words remained indistinct. Drowned in the beauty of her melodious voice. Whether issuing instructions or expressing discontent. Her demeanor remained composed. Her voice never escalating. After a moment. A well-dressed young man entered the living room. Bearing a striking resemblance to a corporate businessman. To Toya's shock. It was Pablo. Rushing toward him eagerly. Toya called out. But the man seemed oblivious to her presence. Gazing past her as if she were invisible. Perplexed. She noticed a disparity. A subtle difference between this man resembling Pablo and the real Pablo. As though he wore a stretched mask. Yet. Despite this discrepancy. Toya couldn't resist the captivating allure of his charm. Feeling inexplicably drawn to him. In that moment. A distraught young woman made her entrance. Her eyes red and swollen from crying. She continued sobbing. Seemingly caught in an unending wave of emotion. The woman in the robe spoke sternly and decisively. Prompting a sharp response from the girl. Who hissed in a loud whisper. May you die. You cursed witch. With those words. The girl swiftly exited the living room. Meanwhile. The lady. Laughing with an unsettling tone. Turned her attention toward Toya. Startled. Toya woke up abruptly. Despite her efforts. She couldn't recall even the slightest detail of the lady's face from her dream. It appeared as a blank white spot in her memory. Her forehead damp with sweat. Toya's gaze immediately fell upon the portrait. In her dream. The person she saw was entirely different from the one depicted. Although strongly resembling Pablo. There was something distinct about the features. The lines on the face were different. Conveying a kinder. Purer. Simpler countenance. Toya noticed a peculiar pattern, these unsettling dreams. Occurred solely from Thursday to Friday. A childhood rhyme echoed in her mind. One she used to chant with the girls at the orphanage. While predicting their future husbands. From Thursday to Friday. From Friday to Friday. Star. Starlet. 
whoever loves will appear in a dream. She arranged for Julia to visit later in the evening. Although Toya didn't drive, Julia was an enthusiastic driver. Cruising around town in her red Mazda. Julia's life had been relatively smooth sailing. Owing to her easygoing, conflict-free nature since their orphanage days. However, Toya harbored knowledge about Valerio, Julia's husband, being unfaithful, a secret she hadn't disclosed. Unsure if Julia was aware. If she wasn't. Tough times awaited Julia. Julia was engrossed in Toya's astonishing narrative and suggested consulting a familiar psychic or wizard with inherited gifts from her great-grandmother. Toya teased about charging for readings. But Julia persisted, claiming the psychic was genuine. Unlike charlatans, citing her grandmother's prowess in coffee ground divination, Julia arranged an appointment with the psychic. Known not only for psychic abilities but also for deciphering dreams. However, Toya didn't meet this psychic until two years later. Under different circumstances. A year passed. During which she continued her successful work. At the Registro Civil while raising her twins. She witnessed Julia's tumultuous disputes with her husband. Yet the couple remained together. Ending their dramas on a positive note. Julia was fortunate in that aspect. Her longing for Pablo had gradually transformed into a calm, meandering river. Smoothly bypassing the occasional hurdles of resurfacing memories. Toya experienced these recurring dreams three more times, each featuring the same imperious lady and a man. Bearing an uncanny resemblance to Pablo as the central figures. Yet. These dreams had become wearisome. She consciously avoided dwelling on their contents. For they hadn't brought any substantial alterations to her life. Preferring not to delve into conjectures. She stored the contents of these dreams away. In the recesses of her memory without further examination. On a bustling Saturday. Numerous solemn marriage registrations were scheduled. Toya didn't always handle the paperwork herself. She relied on assistance. Often unfamiliar with the couples deciding to tie the knot. Following a particularly jubilant ceremony. Toya settled into her beloved chair. Removing her slightly uncomfortable new shoes and requesting a cup of coffee. As she leaned back. Closing her eyes. An unexpected internal stirring unsettled her. A discomfort arising beneath her breastbone. A lump formed in her throat, prompting a need for fresh air. Gripped by panic. She clutched the armrest. Bewildered. What's happening to me? She muttered anxiously. Alarmed by the prospect of a panic attack. There were waiting couples relying on her. Forcing herself to stand. She poured a glass of water and drank it hastily. Finding some relief. Approaching the window where birch trees swayed with autumn leaves. She drew deep breaths. Calming the physical distress. Yet an inner unease lingered. Her heart raced. An agitation simmering deep within. Yes. She was upset. Particularly about her children. Glancing at the clock. She hurriedly dialed her boy's homeroom teacher. Seeking reassurance. Is everything alright with the boys? In their sixth period literature class. She inquired. Feeling the grip of concern tighten. They're both present in the classroom. Came the teacher's voice over the PA system. As her assistant summoned her to proceed with the registration. Toya composed herself. Pushing aside the turmoil. Marina. Her assistant. Had meticulously arranged all the necessary documents on the table. Needing only Toya to adorn the chain with the coat of arms. With a minute remaining. They were poised to begin. As the assistant swung open the majestic white. And gold door of the marble hall. 
ushering the wedding couple inside. Mendelssohn's march commenced its familiar melody. Toya assumed her position, donning an appropriate expression and offering. A welcoming glance to the couple upon their entrance. However, an unexpected upheaval ensued. The ground seemed to shift beneath her, distorting the furniture, carpet, walls, and everyone present. In a moment of disorientation, Toya shut her eyes tightly, then flung them open abruptly. There stood Pablo, holding hands with a radiant woman in a white dress. He appeared alive, unharmed, and smiled, exuding an anticipation of celebration in his festive attire. It was her living Pablo, her beloved. Suddenly, the world spun in a dizzying whirl before snapping back into place. Overwhelmed with a sheer frenzy, Toya screamed. Pablo! In a state of pure agitation, she sprang out from behind the table, clutching it tightly, and dashed towards the groom, her heart racing with a frenetic urgency. Pablo! Is it you? Is it really you? She questioned frantically, her hands trembling as she grasped his, clutching the lapels of his jacket, desperately seeking recognition. The onlookers in the hall grew puzzled. Murmurs and whispers rippling through the guests. Some likely relatives swiftly approaching the commotion. Questions bombarded both Toya and the groom. Seeking an explanation for the bewildering scene. The director rushed over. Trailed by other concerned employees. Yet amidst the chaos. Toya's vision focused solely on Pablo. The poor man utterly taken aback. Remained speechless for several moments. Shaken by the suddenness of the situation. Eventually. Collecting himself. He uttered in bewilderment. Wait. I don't understand. You're mistaken. I am not Pablo. Toya fixed him with a wild gaze. Her hands trembling against his chest. Tears streaming down her face. Pablo. It's me. Toya. Don't you recognize me? Pablo. My God. How is this possible? I buried you. She cried out in disbelief. Her emotions engulfing her in a whirlwind of confusion. The bride. Pushed aside amidst the turmoil. Stood aghast. Realizing that her groom might harbor hidden secrets. Observing him, she noted he appeared older, possibly in his forties, sparking speculation about undisclosed stories from his past. Approaching Toya with a mix of shock and concern, Katerina attempted to defuse the tension, suggesting they move to her office. Let's all go to my office. My dear Toya, there's no need for a scene. Please. Let's calm down and sort everything out. She implored. Offering solace in the midst of chaos. Meanwhile. The man. Now identified as Salvador Castro. Gently grasped Toya's hands. Attempting to convey understanding and empathy. Listen. My name is Salvador Castro. You're mistaken. Please. Try to calm down. If you don't believe me, take a look at my documents. He urged, showing patience despite his own confusion. However, Toya remained fixated on his face, convinced she stood face to face with Pablo. She rushed to the table, grabbing the prepared marriage certificate, only to find the same name Salvador had just mentioned. Astounded, she muttered almost to herself. It can't be. Marina. Bring my passport from my bag in the office. Quickly. Toya commanded urgently. Determination etched on her face. As her assistant hurried back with the passport. Toya retrieved a photograph from beneath its cover. 
handing it to Salvador. This is my late husband. Pablo Delgado. He passed away many years ago. She declared. Desperation lacing her voice. Salvador. Now even more bewildered. Examined the photo where he saw his own image. Albeit about a decade younger. Stunned. He whispered. I haven't died yet. A realization dawning upon him in the midst of the inexplicable situation. Facing his bride. Salvador's expression shifted to one of bafflement and concern. Nora. My dear. He began, attempting to quell her apparent distress. Please. Don't look at me like that. I honestly have no idea what's happening here. Is this some sort of divorce proceeding or an elaborate prank orchestrated by someone? His voice rose hysterically. Who set up this farce? Who hired you? What do you want from me? If it's money, name your price. I'll pay anything. Just leave us alone. The groom's demands bordered on desperation as he turned to the director. Director. Just register us as husband and wife without any celebration. Just register us. He implored urgently. Toya softly replied. My name is Toya. Amidst the escalating tension. This isn't a prank. You bear an uncanny resemblance to my late husband. It's uncanny. She added. Meeting his gaze with profound sadness. Suddenly. She gasped aloud. Oh my god. You're the man from my dreams. The one wearing a mask. Toya's revelation stunned the groom further. Causing him to shake his head in disbelief. Toya. I can't make sense of any of this. It's an incredible mystery. A mysticism of sorts. He murmured. Almost in disbelief. But look closely at the photos. It's not me. He emphasized. Extending the photograph back to her. Acknowledging the discrepancy. Toya responded impassively. Yes. I've realized that it's not you. She abruptly seemed to grasp the futility of the situation. Who are you then? That's all I want to know. She stated, resigned to the lack of clarity or resolution. With a sudden sense of indifference. As if drained of all energy. Toya slowly made her way toward the staff door. Wait. Toya. Hold on. Salvador called out desperately. Pleading for resolution. We need to figure this out. There's no other way. He hesitated. Almost begging. Please. Marry us. I'm begging you. However. As he turned to look for Nora. The bride had disappeared. Leaving Toya to make a decisive choice. Determined to seek answers. Toya made an impulsive decision and sought the psychic without informing anyone. Not even Julia. She arrived at the psychic's place and was greeted by a girl, who likely served as the psychic's secretary. Led to a waiting area. Toya observed the typical reception setup. Gray wallpapered walls. Neutral curtains. Comfortable furniture. A setting that exuded an air of mystery and allure akin to a scene from a captivating TV series. After a brief wait, the secretary escorted her into an adjacent room. Inside, subdued lighting illuminated antique-style furniture, creating an aura of authenticity or well-crafted replicas. A candle flickered in a silver candlestick on a carved table, enhancing the intriguing ambience. Soon, a woman emerged from behind heavy curtains. Taking a seat at a table adorned with intricate wooden swirls. Her black hair styled elegantly in a high bun, accentuated by a glinting silver band at the hairline. Framed her eyes. Dark pools framed by lush. Extended lashes. Her nails adorned with a dark hue. 
meticulously painted, gleamed against her long, slender fingers adorned with exclusive silver rings. Silver or white gold earrings dangled elegantly from her ears, adding an air of uniqueness and sophistication. Toya couldn't help but wonder about the allure of the accessories. As the psychic gazed at her intently, Toya felt a tinge of nervousness creeping in. Before Toya could introduce herself, the psychic directly questioned, What would you like to discuss? About my husband. Toya responded, initiating the conversation. The psychic held her gaze, causing Toya to feel a faint nervousness. Are you Toya or Luce? The question caught Toya off guard, raising her eyebrows as if poised to ask something. But the psychic preempted her. They wanted to name you Luce before your birth. But upon your arrival, you were named Toya after your maternal great-grandmother. Surprised by the accuracy, Toya widened her eyes in amazement. Yes. That's right. She confirmed. My husband passed away over nine years ago. But recently, I've encountered someone who bears an uncanny resemblance to him. I want to know everything about this person. Toya's voice wavered under the weight of her emotions. Yet she met the psychic's probing gaze with resolve. He died of his own accord. An accident. A technical mishap. The psychic stated emotionlessly. Staring at the photograph Toya handed over. There was no foul play involved. He was Norman or Pablo. The psychic continued. Evoking a mixed surge of emotions in Toya. Her eyes welled up with tears as she recounted. The investigation confirmed a freight truck hit him, causing the car to explode. Pablo burned to death. The truck driver had fallen asleep at the wheel, struggling to comprehend. Toya was tempted to question how the psychic deduced the name from the picture. But the psychic continued unprompted, confirming Pablo's identity. Yes. That's right. He was called Pablo. But there's no foul play involved. She reiterated. Even as tears streamed down Toya's cheeks. I do have photographs of the person resembling Pablo. Toya added. Reaching for her bag and retrieving several pictures. These are not official portraits. They're with our working photographer. She explained while passing them to the psychic. The psychic meticulously sifted through the photos examining each with great care and attention. And mm -hmm. Practically identical. The psychic muttered. Deeply engrossed in her scrutiny. She seemed to look beyond the surface. As if peering into the very essence of the images. Once more recoiling from the photos. She emitted a sudden burst of energy. Exhaling as if releasing a held breath. These photos. She declared. Are not of Pablo. I know it's not Pablo. Exclaimed Toya with a mix of excitement and urgency. I need to understand who this doppelganger is. Who is he? The psychic. Unmoved by Toya's fervor. Maintained her composed demeanor. Speaking evenly. She said. He is his blood brother. A twin. You can verify my words by conducting a DNA analysis. DNA? How can I do that? Pablo is no longer alive. Toya responded. Her mind reeling with newfound revelations. You have twins. Don't you? The psychic's question jolted Toya once more. If these are Pablo's children, then they are his blood nephews. She realized aloud. Picking up one of the photos again, Toya stared into the flame of the candle, grappling with the revelations. Nephews of Salvador. She murmured, connecting the dots. His name is Salvador. He was given that name in infancy by his adoptive parents. Carrying their surname. The psychic revealed.
Surprised by the depth of the psychic's knowledge, Toya questioned. How do you know all of this? Did Julia tell you something? But the psychic maintained her enigmatic expression. I just see it. Dear. Julia has nothing to do with this. She replied with an inscrutable smile barely touching her lips. I can tell you that Salvador is currently successful in his endeavors. Perhaps in construction or home repair. But unfortunately. He's unsuccessful in matters of personal happiness. The psychic continued. Causing Toya to ponder over the complexities of Salvador's life. The version of a blood relationship that. Pablo has a twin brother is the only reasonable and plausible explanation. She added thoughtfully. Let me tell you about the dreams. Toya began. Recounting the recurring dreams she had been experiencing for years. The psychic listened attentively to the tale of these haunting dreams. Absorbing every detail. Take the candle on the table and drip the wax into the water. The psychic instructed. Guiding Toya's trembling hands. Toya followed the instructions. Watching as the drops of wax formed solid clumps in the water. The psychic studied them intently for an extended period before drawing back. Exhaling deeply. I see the lady from your dream is Pablo's grandmother. Salvador is his brother. And the woman sending the curse is the mother of the brothers. She appeared in the dream in her younger form. Their mother has long passed away. The psychic revealed. Dreams are irrational phenomena. Mixing things up. Changing sequences. Or blending distant times and individuals into one storyline. The psychic explained. Therefore. Deciphering dreams requires considering all these intricacies. I can shed light on certain aspects. But it will take time. For now. Our conversation is over. Please give me advice. Help me. My soul is restless. Pleaded Toya. You have two options. The psychic responded calmly. First. Do nothing and continue living as you have for the past two years. Second. Confirm the DNA relationship between Pablo and Salvador. Use this irrefutable evidence to start inquiries. Perhaps beginning with the maternity hospital where the twins were born. To find out why they never knew about each other. I foresee captivating and astonishing details emerging from the investigation. If you can. Come with Salvador to me. Interaction with a living person will reveal more details. All right. I will try. Thank you. Toya settled her bill with the secretary. Who escorted her to the exit. Displaying no emotion whatsoever. Throughout her life. Toya had dismissed magicians. Sorcerers. Fortune tellers. Or seers as nonsense attributing their abilities to mere human intuition and psychology. She believed a magician was probably an experienced, knowledgeable psychologist, not a real wizard. However, today, she found herself deeply impressed. She realized she trusted this woman and was genuinely intrigued by her. By the way, Toya remembered that she had never come across any advertisements for the services of this particular magician, whose name remained unknown for now. In the evening, Salvador Castro called Toya. Naturally, she expected Salvador to arrive soon, as he had been restless ever since the incident at the Registro Civil. He felt there was hidden information behind the situation, and it concerned him directly. This information had to be unearthed. He felt that there was something of utmost importance about himself that he didn't know. Something that defined the essence of his life. He confidently dialed the registration office's number. I'm listening. She responded after a few rings. Hello. Toya. It's Salvador Castro. Good evening. Yes. I recognized your voice. 
I'd like to meet with you. Please find some time for me, we need to talk. And the sooner. The better. Can you tell me when you're free? I wouldn't mind talking to you either. Salvador requested. I have some information that might. Let's say. Surprise you. During the phone call. Toya strategically built a wall. Keeping some distance. Thereby intensifying the intrigue. Over the past few days. She had come to terms with the fact that Salvador was. Of course. Not Pablo miraculously risen from the dead. She could now clearly identify all the differences. In the appearance of the two newly discovered twins. She noticed distinctions in their voices. Mannerisms. Overall behavior and even their world views, vividly remembering what her Pablo had been like. However, she admitted to herself that the magnetic attraction she had felt towards the man in her dreams had been rekindled. Well then, I'm expecting an incredible story. She responded. So, when and where shall we meet? Salvador asked. Let's meet tomorrow at 6. How about the Harmony Cafe? Just a block away from the Registro Civil. Is that suitable for you? Got it. See you there. Goodbye. Salvador said. And Toya hung up. The night flew by in an instant. She had fallen into a deep sleep. Waking up at exactly 5.30. Well rested. Full of energy. In a good mood and confident that all her worries and fears had dissipated. Indeed, she felt a surge of activity and a thirst for action, along with a strong desire to embark on a new venture. Even if this new venture turned out to be an investigation, to uncover everything about the origins of Pablo and Salvador and discover the reasons for their separation or estrangement. Who exactly was behind the tragedy of these two clothes? Relatives losing each other. When Salvador came to the table and greeted her. Toya had become utterly convinced that. Despite their uncanny resemblance. He was fundamentally distinct from his brother. Subtle divergences in their facial structures and features were evident to him. Pablo possessed rounder cheeks. While Salvador's were slightly elevated. Pablo boasted a broader forehead. Whereas Salvador's was narrower. Pablo's lips were plump and smoothly contoured. Whereas Salvador's were thinner. Both had brown eyes. But Toya now discerned that Pablo's eyes were a shade lighter than Salvador's darker ones. Even their hairstyles were dissimilar. Pablo preferred a very short buzz cut. While Salvador sported a more stylish longer haircut. Their voices also differed. With Salvador having a deeper tone and Pablo possessing a slightly higher pitch. Their mannerisms further set them apart. As Pablo was more reserved and modest. While Salvador was carefree and relaxed. Among other differences. Initiating the conversation. Toya began. Yesterday. I visited a psychic. But before Toya could continue, their interlocutor interrupted. Expressing frustration. Are we going to discuss something serious or indulge in nonsense? My plans are disrupted. My wife left me. And I need to find out what's going on. Toya paused. Determined to finish. Wait. Let me explain. I don't intend to delve into the psychic visit's details right now. I want to get straight to the point. Salvador. You and Pablo are two blood brothers. Twins. Toya stated firmly. Cautioning against interruption. Salvador coughed in surprise. Then inquired. A DNA analysis. Whose DNA? Yours and mine. Toya replied and that of my children. Pablo and I have twin boys as well. If there's a match, 
then they are your nephews. And that means you and Pablo are biological brothers. Salvador fell silent. His gaze fixed on the woman before him. Realizing she wasn't speaking without reason. Leaning on the table. He rested his temple on his fingers before finally speaking. You know. Toya. He began after contemplating. I had precisely this notion from the start. That Pablo is my brother. Toya. Intrigued. Remained cautious. Expecting an interesting explanation. Salvador did not disappoint. I was adopted at birth. He revealed. Unfortunately. My adoptive parents are no longer alive. They were wonderful people. And I cherished them deeply. When my dad fell seriously ill. They decided to reveal the truth to me. It was really tough emotionally, they couldn't tell me anything about my biological parents. Because they knew nothing about them. They adopted me from the maternity ward. And during the adoption. Neither party is provided any information about the other. Pablo also mentioned that he was left at the maternity ward. Toya added. You know. When I saw the photo of your husband. My first thought was that he's my brother. People can't be so identical for no reason. They can resemble each other. But not to the extent of being clones. To think that I might be correct actually made me feel good. I thought if that were the case. It's just amazing because it means I'm not alone on this earth. Toya subtly smiled in response to his heartfelt thoughts. It's a pity that Pablo is gone. I'm absolutely sure that we are brothers. If that's the case, then I'm not alone. I have nephews. Salvador also smiled. I agreed to the DNA test. Toya nodded. It was clear she was about to bid him farewell. Wait a moment. Toya. Are you in a hurry? Toya performed her favorite gesture. Shrugging. My children are independent. Actually. I'm not in a hurry. Then I suggest we have dinner. To be honest. I'm as hungry as a whale. I haven't eaten almost the entire day. But it's not just about that. I just feel like right now. Suddenly. I'm at ease. I want to relax. I work every day with overwhelming stress. Otherwise. I wouldn't survive. Please accept my offer. Don't refuse. Let's get to know each other better. Because we have some big joint ventures ahead. He grinned widely. And Toya's heart fluttered a bit. His smile reminded her of Pablo. A remarkable similarity. All right. Let's have dinner. She said. Then please join me in the car. We'll go to a different restaurant over dinner with a glass of wine. Toya and Salvador engaged in animated conversation. Toya learned that Salvador held a top position in a construction company founded by his adoptive father and his friend. However, she didn't perceive a flashy business with extravagant wealth or ventures but rather a challenging, risk-filled life of hard workers surviving day by day in their way. Salvador expressed his desire for a family and children. After the dreadful truth revealed by his adoptive parents, he yearned even more strongly for a stable family life. The horror lay in the fact that he couldn't fathom how people could abandon their children. Yet he struggled to settle down. He hadn't formed serious relationships with any women who crossed his path. Nora had a certain charm despite the significant age difference. When a man is the elder partner. It's not as daunting. Any man at any age can be a groom. He fell in love with a young. Charming woman. But she sought money and status. The dream of a strong family likely didn't resonate. With her after the incident at Registro Civil. Nora refused to listen to Salvador and disappeared from his life. It had been quite some time since that incident. 
But Salvador soon realized that he felt nothing for Nora anymore. All his thoughts were now focused on something else. And he almost married that girl. Eventually. Toya persuaded Salvador to visit the psychic with her. He could. At least. Delve beyond ordinary human curiosity. Besides. Salvador had never encountered mystical individuals before. And it seemed intriguing. Reluctantly. Salvador agreed to visit the psychic for Toya's sake. On the appointed day. They entered a room furnished in an antique style. The psychic appeared before them in a long iridescent robe. Adorned with silver and various gemstones. Her hair was loose. Held in place with something resembling a headband. Like last time. A candle and a silver holder burned on the table. Casting shadows around the room. Toya noticed a sardonic smile on Salvador's lips but chose not to react. Seated in front of the psychic. She commanded Salvador. Close your eyes. He complied reluctantly. All this hocus-pocus seemed ridiculous to him. But he had promised Toya. The woman took a stone from a large crystal bowl and, leaning toward Salvador, began moving the stone, outlining his head and shoulders, while making various airy figures with her hands. Her face remained impassive, and her eyes appeared glassy. Then, she exhaled and shook off an energetic bundle, straightening up in her chair with elaborate wooden swirls. Salvador sat still with his eyes closed, seemingly in a trance. It was evident that the psychic had induced some kind of hypnotic state. Answer my questions with just two words. Yes or no. The psychic directed. Toya expected the psychic to start asking Salvador questions and he would respond as if in a hypnotic session. However, something different unfolded. The psychic also closed her eyes and froze, not moving at all. Toya couldn't hear the questions the psychic was asking Salvador, or the answers he was providing. She watched this silent dialogue with curiosity, but drowsiness overcame her. The concentrated silence in the room the flickering flame, and the pleasant herbal scent that filled the air lulled her. Making her body feel weightless, Toya lost track of time. At some point, the psychic abruptly opened her black eyes, and instructed Salvador to do the same. Salvador woke up as if bewitched, staring at the sorceress as if under a spell. The woman shook off the energy coma again and, looking straight ahead, began to enumerate the factual material. You went back in time to the early days of your existence. The initial scene. You see yourself lying in a crib with metal bars. And next to you is another crib where someone's hands have placed a baby. That's your brother. Next scene. You're crying. You feel yourself being lifted. And you see a young woman. That's your mother. She touches your cheek with her lips. And you feel comfortable. Now you hear your mother's voice. She's singing a lullaby. Next scene. An office. On one side of the desk is a doctor in a white coat. And on the other side is your young mother. She's writing something on paper. The door opens. And another woman enters the room. That's your grandmother. Salvador spoke. His expression grimacing as if something inside him was breaking. Sensing Salvador's reaction. The psychic stopped speaking and lightly clapped her hands. Salvador. Snapping out of it. Returned to his normal self. He noticed Toya. Who had been sitting there motionless. And remembered the fantastical setting of the room. He was brought back to reality. A woman in her senior years entered the room. Salvador mysteriously commented. A familiar face. It feels like I've seen her somewhere before. Your negative reaction to the elderly woman. In the vision prevents me from continuing. 
Otherwise, there could be a threat to your health. The psychic stated. I affirm that Salvador and Pablo were separated by this woman. And what about the woman who appeared in my vision? Toya asked. It's the same woman. There is evil in her. Salvador responded. His eyes moistening. Our mother. She had a sorrowful. Submissive expression. She was young and beautiful with dark brown hair. She was in a state of dependency. They forced her. It's fascinating to know what compelled her to. Obey and sign away her children. Contrary to her earlier refusal to continue. The psychic turned to Salvador. Commanding once again. Close your eyes and envision that elderly lady. As soon as she appears in your imagination. Let me know. Salvador closed his eyelids and concentrated. After about 30 seconds. He spoke. I see her. She's entered. The psychic immediately brought a live flame to him. Moved it before him. And abruptly overturned the candle. Pouring wax into the water basin. Open your eyes. She commanded. Salvador raised his eyelids and observed as the psychic gazed intensely. Into the water where small clumps of wax floated like tiny boats. Finally. The sorceress triumphantly declared. This woman is still alive. Toya and Salvador exchanged a simultaneous glance. Maybe you could also give me her address. Salvador quipped sarcastically. Amused by the ignorance. The psychic responded. I won't give you her address. But I will tell you that she is ill. Find your wicked grandmother. And then you will learn everything you're interested in. Where should we look for her? Toya asked rhetorically. You can start by checking the clinics. Besides her other ailments. She has diabetes. So she's likely registered with an endocrinologist. Her name has something to do with the letter L. There is an L letter in her name. Both at the beginning and in the middle. It's a name that's uncommon in the language. It's exotic. The psychic explained. Turning to Salvador once more. She asked. Do you remember her face? I will clap my hands. And you will recall the features of her face. Keep them in your memory. Look at this woman without taking your eyes off her. It should feel like she's seen you. Close your eyes. Salvador. The psychic clapped her hands. Her gaze cold and unrelenting as she maintained her focus on the man. Seconds passed. Open your eyes. She finally commanded. Salvador came back to himself. Feeling tired and unable to endure more of these magical ordeals. The psychic released the energy with a heavy exhale. Also reaching her limit. Your grandmother's name is Lorenza. She stated. Toya ran her hand across her forehead. Cheek. And neck. Marveling at the magical display she had just witnessed. Check the clinics. Which ones? In which city? Are they here in our city or in other cities? Toya inquired. Dear guests. For today. That's all. The psychic hinted at their immediate departure. There might be geographical complications. Come back another time. But today. That's it. The visitors bid their host farewell and. Stepped out into the fresh air and sunlight. What do you think? Toya asked Salvador. He shrugged. It's shocking. I can't seem to shake it off. I really saw her and our mother. It's rather strange. But then. Who is my. Or rather. Our. Father. In your dreams. Did you see any other man? No. Only Pablo. I mean. You. Toya replied. Salvador paused and turned to Toya. What are you thinking? Toya. 
Do I need to search for this woman? Lorenza. Our grandmother. Maybe we should just leave things as they are. Aren't you curious about why they condemned you to such a fate? Why did they treat you so cruelly? Your life could have taken any direction. If this woman is still alive. You could uncover family secrets and find out who you really are. I mean. I'm not directly involved. It's your family. But I'm involved. I'm Pablo's children's mother. Your captors. Or do you not believe that? Shall we proceed with the examination? Toya suggested. Salvador gripped her shoulders. Of course. We should. I'll call you. They parted ways. And two weeks later. Salvador showed Toya the results of a molecular genetic examination. Manuel and CSO were indeed Salvador's blood nephews. A fact that neither Toya Delgado nor Salvador Castro had doubted for a long time. At the age of 20. Julia graduated from college. Studying to become an interior designer. Caterina Morales mentored her and got her into an agency. That held a prominent place in the city. In her years working at the agency. She excelled professionally. Participating in numerous projects. Both large and small including some of her own design. Julia always seemed to have luck on her side. Regardless of the obstacles that arose. She navigated through them with a hidden strength. Never displaying the immense effort she exerted. Because she didn't like anyone seeing how difficult things could be for her. Sociable and positive. Julia always wished everyone well. Maintaining an effortlessly upbeat demeanor. Perhaps it was precisely this light-hearted approach. That made everything turn out the way it did. Upon learning the news of what had transpired with Toya. And Salvador at the psychic's place. Julia became excited. Like a child with a new project. She crafted an action plan and presented it not just to one friend. But to an entire group. Her friends were more than willing to support Salvador who turned out to be as charming and active as he had appeared in Toya's dream. As an interior designer, Julia had connections and the right acquaintances within the client network. She carefully selected candidates, focusing on specific individuals, including professionals in the medical field, legal experts, municipal archives, and others. Toya marveled at the intricacies of Julia's thought process. At the right moments in life, her cognitive system functioned with astonishing precision and coordination. Hitting the target bullseye. This little woman could execute even the most significant operations with the efficiency of a master. Toya couldn't help but think that Julia would have been the top spy if she were involved in espionage. Even Salvador with his status, couldn't find as many tracks leading to the achievement of their goals as Julia had. At a certain point, Julia recalled a distant acquaintance, a prosecutor with connections and access to the offices of institutions where entry was practically forbidden. She requested an audience and reintroduced herself to the prosecutor. Domingo Grandis a solid middle-aged man in his fifties. He jokingly lamented that he was no longer young enough to win Julia over but found her captivating. She narrated an embellished tale about separated twin brothers, making it clear that without a sinister mastermind behind the scenes, the chief scriptwriter and director of this touching story wouldn't be dealing with a 100% clean slate. She implied that the investigator could uncover the remaining secrets of a crime committed many years ago. Over the course of a month, Julia, Toya, and Salvador discovered that Pablo and Salvador were born in maternity. Hospital number one in the city. Three days after their birth, their mother submitted a statement, renouncing her newborn twin sons 
one of the infants was immediately adopted by a family. With all the information matching Salvador's confirmed details. The second twin was placed in a foster home. After being discharged from the hospital. The current director of the orphanage provided. The address where the boy had been sent. When he was three years old. Toya and Julia couldn't help but shed tears. This orphanage was where they had spent their early years. But what about the mother of the twins? Who was she? And where was she now? This was what worried Salvador the most. However. The investigator managed to trace her as well. Starting from the maternity hospital. He gathered general information that proved sufficient. To locate the woman who had given birth. To twin boys on a specific date. Her name was Aurelia Herrero. A native of a village located just 100 kilometers from the city. In the village. The investigator learned that she had been taken away. By a man who married her against the wishes of his parents. A man from a respectable city family. The girl's parents. Pablo and Salvador's grandparents. Had already passed away. The investigator led a team of searchers to the village. Where they saw the paternal home of the brothers. Where their roots truly originated. Although the house was occupied by complete strangers. The owners welcomed the search team warmly. Remarkably. When they realized who they were dealing with. They handed Salvador a large wooden box containing photographs. Letters. And two small notebooks with notes. This unexpected find had been discovered in the attic. Stored in an old chest. For some reason. Its contents hadn't been destroyed. Left there until now. The discovery astonished the search team. And the friends immediately began to study the archive. Which ultimately provided them with a sense of. Who and where to look next. Salvador sat at his writing desk in his home office. The smallest of the four rooms in his comfortable. Apartment designated as his office. A small. Soft transformer couch was positioned to the right of the entrance. While floor to ceiling bookshelves lined the left wall. And extended over the table. Filled with literature. The desk. Made of light wood. Was situated so that the window's light fell on the left side above the couch. On the table, dear to his heart. Photographs were displayed in frames. A stylish marble writing instrument set with inkwells and. A pen adorned with gilded feathers stood alongside a desk lamp. Folders and a laptop lay on the table. The windows were covered with matte white curtains and greenish blue drapes. The walls and furniture upholstery were colored in a shade of seafoam green. Salvador examined the photographs in the wooden box. That had been handed to him. A pulse of emotion stirred somewhere beneath his heart. But he felt detached from all the events. As if he were observing them from a distance. Could all these unbelievable. Almost fantastical events really be happening to him. There were only a few photographs. He saw unfamiliar people but easily recognized. His real mother and father among them. They sat hand in hand with happy. Youthful smiles. On the back of the photograph was written. Aurelia and Ursabo. With some dates. His father's name was Ursio. And his mother's name was Aurelia. He simply stared at the familiar faces that had appeared out of nowhere. Realizing how much he and Pablo resembled their father. They didn't need an analysis. It was immediately apparent that he was their dad. He set the photograph aside to be cleaned up and placed in a frame later. And there she was. The cunning grandmother in the photo. The grandmother appeared much younger than the one Salvador. Had met in his vision during the visit to the Magina. She was a beautiful woman. Perhaps too beautiful. With aristocratic features that spoke of breeding. But she emanated coldness. Inaccessibility. And was devoid of warmth. A snow queen. It seemed. 
Her intentions were just as cold. As if to pierce the human heart with a shard of ice and freeze it. Salvador turned the photograph over and read the inscription. To my beloved. From Lorenza. Yours alone. There was no date. Just a few words. But behind them lay an entire destiny. A sprawling novel. Who was this photo intended for? Or whom did she want to give it to? Who was this beloved one? If she was giving this card as a keepsake. It meant she loved someone. This cold Lorenza had loved someone. Perhaps his grandfather. In the wooden box. There were ten letters. They turned out to be from a certain Fernando Lopez. It was ordinary correspondence between Aurelia and her friend. With conversations about everyday matters. However. Salvador's special attention was drawn to two letters. In one. Fernando responded to Aurelia's story about meeting a guy. Who came to their village for a plein air session. How she fell in love with him. And that this guy was studying at the art academy. In the other letter. Fernando wished Aurelia happiness in her married life. Adding that marrying such a prominent and wealthy man was a stroke of luck. Apparently, Aurelia had told her friend about her marriage. So. There it was. Their father was an artist. Now. If only he could find out his true last name. These were valuable pieces of information. In the notebooks. There were many notes hastily jotted down, recipes. Poems transcribed from collections. Some addresses and phone numbers. As well as notes with unclear purposes. In short. A compilation of various things. Salvador. Of course. First looked at the addresses and phone numbers. Among them. He immediately noticed two addresses. One in the capital city and the other in a neighboring village. He thought that investigator Domingo would. Have quite a bit of work to do this week. Salvador's head was pounding as he tried to. Process all these numbers and speculations. He picked up his phone. He wanted to talk to Toya. She answered right away. Toya. Hello. It's Salvador. Can you spare a minute? When will you be free? Oh. Salvador. Good evening. I'm already free. Standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus. May I come to pick you up now? Do you want me to take you home? Sure. I'm across from the square at the Registro Civil. Come by. They drove through the city in the evening. With the street lights illuminating their way on the journey. Salvador shared the contents of the chest documents. He had brought with him and said. We need to check the two addresses without delay. My gut feeling tells me that Lorenza's grandmother lives in the capital city. Although her son studied in another city. There is no information related to that in the letters and notes. However. The capital city is mentioned. We need to hurry. As Lorenza's grandmother might leave this world sooner rather than later. And we need her alive. Listen. Let's drop by Domingo's office. I think he's really interested in our case. They headed to the investigator's office. Domingo had just closed his office and was about to leave the prosecutor's building when his mobile phone rang. He agreed to help and told them to come to his workplace. Salvador handed him the wooden box, saying, Domingo, you know what needs to be done with this. Goodbye. Salvador turned towards the entrance and helped Toya out of the car. Toya. I want to ask you something. Salvador began steering the conversation in a certain direction. Toya raised an inquisitive eyebrow. One of her trademark gestures. Go ahead. About what? Salvador hesitated for a moment but then overcame his shyness and asked. Do your boys know about me? I mean... The fact that I'm their real uncle. She shrugged and moved her head to the side. 
I don't know. To be honest. Sooner or later. They will find out about you. I suppose. It's only a matter of time. I need to prepare them. I don't want this revelation to distress their young minds. You are practically their father's doppelganger. I understand. Replied Toya. Salvador didn't rush to leave. He was contemplating whether to confess to Toya now. Or continue to wait for the right moment. The so-called perfect timing. He didn't want to scare her off. Good night. My sister-in-law. He said humorously. Toya laughed. Well. Yes. In terms of family hierarchy. You're my sister-in-law. Or rather. My brother's wife. Good night. Salvador. She replied warmly. As Toya entered the building. Salvador sat behind the wheel. Saying to himself. Brother's wife. No. That's not right. Soon she will be my wife. He no longer had any doubts. Because he could sense her feelings toward him. When mutual attraction begins to bloom between people. There is nothing else like it. Meanwhile. As Toya climbed the stairs. She scolded herself. Silly. Crazy girl. Have you lost your mind? He's Pablo's brother. You should stop. But no one had ever succeeded in stopping the heart. Just five days later. Salvador called investigator Domingo. Who had become. By fate's decree. A member of the search team. He invited the whole honest crew to his office. And announced exactly what they had been. So diligently pursuing and. At the same time. Were afraid to hear. In the village. At the family house. Lives none other than Lorenzo Ray. Hold on. Gentlemen and ladies. Julia exclaimed in amazement. Lorenzo Ray. Mario Ray is a renowned artist. So. Does this mean Mario Ray is your great grandfather? And if her son was named Eusebio. Then Eusebio Ray is your father. Father. Well. Friends. This is quite something. Julia was astonished. Losing her ability to speak. Salvador fell silent. Unable to believe his ears. You're absolutely right. Julia. Domingo confirmed. These are very famous artists. Mario Ray is buried in a well-known cemetery. But Eusebio Ray and his wife. Aurelia Herrero. Disappeared under mysterious circumstances. You know what kind of speculation was going around at that time. They said he went abroad with a clean slate. And might have changed his name. They vanished without a trace. Oh my goodness. Toya breathed. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Salvador remained quiet. Gesturing in bewilderment. At a loss for words. We need to go to the village. Toya declared. Tomorrow. First thing. Right. Salvador finally spoke up. He dialed a number on his phone and instructed his secretary. Eleonora. Please book two plane tickets to the capital for me for tomorrow morning. If possible. Or any available flight during the day. What about me? Julia made a mock tearful face. Eleonora. Not two but three tickets. Three business class if possible. But not necessary. Salvador replied confidently. The flight was scheduled for the morning. And he needed a bit of rest and composure. They all went home. And the following day. By evening. The trio set out for the village in a taxi. The driver stopped amidst the woods at the beginning of a raised road. Which they had to traverse for 500 meters on foot. It was house number 7. When the group approached the building. Toya asked aloud. 
before her stood the very two-story mansion. She had seen in one of her previous dreams. It was an old house. Probably built in the 19th century. In its prime. It had been tended to. Partially renovated. And modernized. But now it looked neglected. Moderately untidy. And abandoned. She described. The house was surrounded by a wrought iron fence. Through it. At the rear of the mansion. They could see part of the garden where a gravel path led into the depths. On either side of the path. In a checkerboard pattern. Stood withered. Moisture-stained antique statues that had. Not been well maintained for a long time. There were not many of them. And they were spaced at a decent distance from one another. In the foreground. Flower beds were overgrown with weeds. Behind the house. In the garden. There should be a lake or a pond. Toya said. Where do you know that from? Julia asked with interest. This very house. I saw it in my dream. Toya replied. Oh my. It's like a mystery. Julia remarked. Charmed as if she had stepped into a fairy tale. At the gate. The group noticed a doorbell. Without much thought. Salvador pressed the button four times in a row. In a matter of minutes. They saw a man coming out of the mansion. Bearing a resemblance to a disgruntled monkey. Perhaps he was the caretaker. He approached the gate but didn't open it. Grumbling in a deep voice without any greeting. Who are you? We're here to see Lorenzo Ray on a very important matter. Salvador replied. What matter? The man persisted. At this point. Toya took over the conversation. This is Lorenzo's grandson. She said firmly. Open the door and let us in. Or the police will be here. She fabricated the police threat on the spot. But there was no need to continue arguing with the man. On the spacious porch. An elderly woman appeared with a cane in her right hand. She took a few steps forward to ensure her voice was heard and commanded. Rodrigo. Let them in. The newcomers heard a soft elderly voice. Velvety and rich despite its age. Maintaining a harmonic beauty. Even in her advanced years. Lorenza retained traces of her former beauty. She wore a well coiffed wig and a long dress adorned with a pearl necklace. Despite her limping legs. She chose old-fashioned patented leather shoes with mother-of-pearl accents. The group was led not into the house but into a gazebo. Lorenza Ray gestured for them to take seats on a round bench while she settled in. Much like a queen on her throne. Maintaining a regal air with her hand resting on the knob of her cane. Toya examined her face. Which she had once carefully concealed from her in the dream. And found more and more similarities with Pablo and Salvador. So. Who are you and what do you want? Lorenza asked. It was clear that the old woman had not interacted with society for a long time. Sequestered herself in the mansion due to age and illness. Now, with a readiness bubbling up from within, she was prepared to listen to the living people, who had come from the outside world. But these people had prepared themselves in a certain way, because they knew who they were facing, the one who had brought suffering into their lives. Toya, for instance, felt a strong aversion toward her. This woman seemed to exude a chilling coldness and something else entirely unpleasant. Salvador stared at her directly and finally spoke boldly. Lorenza. I am one of the twins. And my mother. Aurelia. Decided to distance herself from us based on your guidance. I am your grandson. Lorenza's face immediately changed. Contorted. And lost its beauty. She looked at Salvador angrily. What? She bellowed. Though her roar came out hoarse and feeble rather than thunderous. My twin brother. 
your second grandson. Perished. Salvador continued. Raising his voice. But as you can see. I am alive. And I have found you. Neither Toya. Salvador. Nor Julia knew that Domingo. In contact with the capital. Had sent a team of police officers to the village right behind the group of seekers. While the heroes were trying to establish contact with Lorenza. A whole squad of officers was en route to the village. After Salvador's announcement. Chaos ensued. The old woman rose menacingly. Leaning on the back of the bench. Raised her cane high. And shook it. Yelling until she grew hoarse. Get out. Imposter. Get out of here. Rodrigo. Drive these scoundrels away. Out. She wheezed. And the man who bore a resemblance to a monkey rushed at Salvador. Sparking a sudden scuffle. Initially. The women screamed in surprise and fear at the sudden brawl. When they witnessed Lorenza brandishing her cane at Salvador. They rushed toward her. Wrestling her arm to take the weapon away. Salvador subdued the man. Applying a painful technique. Julia acted quickly. Tearing the belt from her jeans and handing it to Salvador. Who used it to bind the caretaker's hands. Leaving him lying on the floor of the gazebo. Lorenza Ray was forcibly seated on the bench. And her cane. Which she had wielded as a weapon. Was confiscated. However. Salvador didn't get a chance to ask her anything else. A hostage rescue team stormed the estate. Although there seemed to be no hostages. Quietly and unnoticed by the group of seekers. Domingo had been conducting investigations into the Ray family. He suspected that Lorenza had ulterior motives for. Her actions regarding the abandoned twins. And he was right. Lorenza. Who had adamantly refused to answer questions was placed in a psychiatric hospital, where she died from a stroke two days later. The entire estate and the adjacent garden were thoroughly examined. The findings sent shivers down everyone's spines. Human remains or bones were discovered inside. Two concrete statues cleverly disguised as ancient sculptures. After a forensic examination, it was revealed that Lorenza had buried her son, and daughter-in-law in these statues. She hadn't personally committed the murders. But had hired a hitman and a mason. Paying them substantial sums to do the gruesome work. Apparently. She had a change of heart when it came to the children and spared their lives. One question remained unanswered. Who was Lauren's husband and Yabo's father? The grandfather of Pablo and Salvador. This person's whereabouts were unknown. As is often the case with mentally disturbed individuals. Or rather inhumane ones. The motive behind their horrifying actions was incredibly banal. Money. Mario Ray had left an astronomical inheritance to. His daughter Lorenza and her son Yusebo. Consisting not only of bank accounts but also of precious. Jewelry and renowned paintings. Lorenza was unwilling to share any of it with anyone with the obsession and cruelty of a maniac. This aristocratic lady eliminated those whom she perceived as threats. Her son, daughter-in-law, and two grandsons. It was shockingly simple and horrifying at the same time. One day, Toya called Salvador. Come over today. I've told the kids about you. And they want to meet you. They're looking forward to seeing you. Toya opened the door. And Salvador Castro stepped inside with a huge. Bouquet of roses and a massive box of customized cake. Manuel and also. Who had grown into young teenagers and. Were beyond the age of childish nicknames. Came out into the hallway. However. They didn't mind that their mother still saw them as her little boys. The boys eyes widened in amazement. 
They had heard from their mom that Salvador was a spitting image of their dad. Pablo. But they hadn't expected him to be this similar. After a while. They got used to Salvador. Realizing that there were many differences between him and their father. Just as there were between Manuel and CSO. Salvador approached a portrait of Pablo and couldn't take his eyes off it for a long time. Tears welling up in his eyes. He felt indescribable emotions that turned his soul inside out. Feelings that couldn't be expressed in words. Hello. Little brother. Look at you. He finally said. Then embraced the boys and repeated. Well, I finally met you today. There was a celebratory dinner during which their mother. And Sal openly shared their love for each other with the children. Two months later. A joyous wedding took place. Starting at the civil registry office where their mother worked as a registrar. Forming a family was a wonderful event. And from then on. Everything depended on the people involved. However. The story didn't end there. Toya and Salvador weren't chasing material wealth. They were merely trying to uncover the reasons. Behind their ancestors' unjust treatment. And figure out their true lineage. But as the saying goes. What goes around comes around. And kindness is repaid in kind. In due time. Salvador inherited his great-grandfather Mario Ray's estate by law. Along with the family house because Salvador Castro. Essentially Salvador Ray. Was the sole direct heir of the family. If you're enjoying it as well. Leave a like to the channel.